mic working okay? Hopefully, perfect, perfect. Uh, today's going to be a fun day. We're going to wrap up these mathematical preliminaries. I promise you this course is fun. You just have to get there. And we have about three more lectures <laughs> before we get there. So slowly but surely. But today wraps up the last of the mathematical preliminaries. Uh, the next three lectures are going to be focused on the concepts of linear maps. So in the last lecture we said, if I want to take a vector and transform it to another vector, I do that through a linear map. So that's going to be the focus of the next three lectures. We're still going to keep it very mathematical. But after that, in lecture seven, we're going to start applying that to actual objects. All right. So if we know the material properties and geometry of an object, we can actually start simulate it, simulating it using all of this math that we're learning. Or we're almost there. The nice part about today is I would say 90% of the material you guys have seen before in Inch 130. Cross product, dot product, it should be very familiar to you guys. I'm going to include some words like Euclidean, which might scare you off, but it really means nothing to you guys. You guys may not have realized it, but everything we do in engineering in that XYZ coordinate system, that's a Euclidean vector space. So something you may not have heard of, but you've definitely seen before. So that's kind of what we're going to get into today. Now, before I do that, uh, I like to try and get as much feedback as possible. How's the course been so far? Any changes you guys would recommend to make it easier for you guys? No? I got one request, and I'm curious what you guys think. I never thought about it. Would you guys like the examples that I solved, the PDFs uploaded to E-Class, of the examples that I solved? All right, so I will do that later tonight. Uh, I just want to remind you guys that <clears throat> when it comes to assignments, I have those assignment guide videos, so you guys can utilize those if you guys don't want to sit through the seminar recordings. Uh, the first seminar was already completed. Uh, again, that section, I'm sorry, because a lot of the stuff that we cover in assignments requires both of the weekly lectures. So the assignment this week includes stuff from today's lecture, but of course we did the seminar and you guys didn't know what we were going to cover today. Uh, for those of you who have the seminar today, it'll be much easier because we'll have covered all the material in the assignments. Now, for online students, which is none of you, <laughs> uh, we're having a seminar today from 5 to 6 on Zoom. You guys can show up if you guys want. The more, the merrier. But uh, it's 5 to 6. You guys are probably thinking, eh, no thanks. So it's, it's completely up to you guys. The seminars will all be identical, except for that first seminar that we did on Tuesday, because the computer wouldn't work, and I had to do it all on the whiteboard. But hopefully the computer works today and the seminars should be good. Now, one thing I want to clear up before we begin is uh, question three of the assignment, because I've gotten a lot of emails. Question three is one equation with three unknowns. So I run St. Clayton, infinite solutions. You're an idiot. Why would you give me something like that? The key here is that there's still solutions. There's just an infinite possibility. All you guys need to do it's just giving me one possibility. That's the nice thing about these questions that we coded, is it'll go through all of the different possibilities and it'll check to see if you're correct. So in those type of questions, which I really want to get you guys used to because they're most likely going to appear on a midterm, where there is infinite possibilities, you guys have to try and figure out one of them. What I like to do in this case is finding the coordinates y1, y2, y3. Three unknowns, one equation. I like to set two of them equal to zero. It makes the calculations much easier, and then I only have one unknown I'm trying to solve for. If you guys want, you guys can set y1 and y3 equal zero, or y2 and y3. It doesn't really matter. You guys can set them all to any number you want. If you guys want to be a troll and throw them all at 69, that'll work. It's up to you guys. So it's just one of the things I want to touch up on assignment three. It'll, it'll save me a lot of late night emails. All right. So that's basically it. Oh, I guess one other thing. Uh, my office has changed. Of course, with the pandemic, uh, you guys may know my office from Inch 130. Uh, I shared it with two other people, but of course, with these social distancing guidelines, uh, they're finding me new accommodations, which basically means I have no office for, I don't know, maybe the next week or so. So office hours today, they will not be in my office. If you guys need to meet, just let me know. I'm just roaming around campus trying to find a Starbucks or something like that. So I can come meet you guys or we can find a space if you guys want to meet and discuss. 
Uh, I haven't gotten a lot of questions so far, which is either a very good thing or a very, very bad thing. I'm going to hope that it's a good thing and that you guys are understanding the material and not the opposite where you guys just don't care. Uh, yeah. So again, uh, we're going to jump into more mathematical stuff. I promise you this course will get better. This is kind of uh, the boring part before we can start applying it. So let's see if I can put that there. Any questions before we begin? No? Wonderful. So today's lecture, we're going to basically look at two different things. The first is a Euclidean vector space, and then the second one is change of basis. The first one sounds like a pile of garbage, but again, it's something you guys have all seen before. You guys know your standard x, y, z coordinate system? That's a Euclidean vector space. The thing you may not have seen before is change of basis. You may not have seen it, but you guys have applied it before. I'll show you an example of change of basis, and you guys will all hate it, because it'll bring back uh, nightmares from 7270. But this is what we are going to do today. So let's go into linear vector spaces. We said that for our vector space to be considered a linear vector space, it has to hold these axioms. Now, I'm not going to get into them, because this was the topic of last lecture. We already went through these. We know how to prove them. And if you're in the seminar today, we're going to go over it again. So these are linear vector spaces. Now, what we didn't talk about is after we have a linear vector space, we can do certain operations within that linear vector space. So the, we're going to look at three specific operations. And the first one is something called a norm function. All right, a norm function. You guys may not have heard of a norm function, but you guys may have heard of its equivalent, the magnitude. You guys remember back from Mench 130, if I gave you three vector components, you guys can find the magnitude or the length of that vector. The idea of a norm function is exactly the same. It wants to describe the size of a vector in a linear vector space. So what we do is we denote it with these kind of double absolute value signs. We would say that this is the norm of vector v. Again, this is something we've covered before. Now, if we were to look at this, the norm function must, must satisfy for any two vectors u and v and for any real scalar alpha, a couple of properties. The first one is positive homogeneity, or positive scalability. What does this mean? Well, it basically means if I take the norm of vector v after it's been multiplied by alpha, well, that's the exact same as taking the norm of v before it's multiplied by alpha and then multiplying it by alpha. One of these fun properties, don't really need to know. The second one is the triangular equality which basically says if I were to take the norm of vector u and v added together, well, it has to be less than or equal to the norm of u plus the norm of v. Another one is the positive definiteness, which says that if the norm of my vector is 0, the only way that is possible is if that is the 0 vector. So again, this is where we're going into these statements with the arrows that we talked about before. Now, it's very easy to go from, OK, if I have a 0 vector, the norm is 0. But what's unique to us is if I were to give you an exam that the norm of a vector is 0, you guys can automatically conclude that that's going to be the 0 vector. So it's these little tricks that are going to help you in exams. If I were to give you this, I don't need to tell you that it's the 0 vector. You guys should know that now. So that's kind of one of the, the fun facts. So what we're going to talk about is the Euclidean norm. There are a bunch of different types of norm functions depending on the applications that you want. In this course, we're going to be focusing on the Euclidean norm, which is the one you guys are all familiar with. If I wanted the norm of a vector, or the magnitude of a vector, do you guys remember the formula for Nth130? The first component squared plus the second component squared plus the third component squared added and square rooted? Well, it's the exact same here. So for an infinite dimension vector space, all I do is I take all the components, v1, v2, v2, all the way up to vn, I square them, add them together, and then throw the square root sign. Again, something you may not have heard of or described like this, but it's something you guys have all seen. So it's pretty nice, pretty easy. Now again, what does this mean for us? This describes the size of our vector. Another thing too is the norm is always a positive scalar for non-zero vectors. If we were to somehow get a negative number, 
all of them are dealing with those imaginary numbers. And again, this course, it's very mathematical, but it's still applicable to the real world. This is a design course. We're learning how to simulate structures. If we're designing with imaginary numbers, well, we got a problem on our hands. So again, if I were to show you this vector v, or negative 2 and 1, and I were to find the Euclidean norm, all I need to do is take all the components, throw it in, I get a value, and what this value physically represents is the actual length of this vector. So that's the Euclidean norm. Is there any questions about the Euclidean norm? I'll probably just call it norm. Euclidean's a bit much. <laughs> all right, so the second one that you guys probably have not seen is a metric or a distance function. So what a metric or a distance function is, is a function that describes the distance between two vectors. If I have two vectors in my vector space, I might be interested in the distance between these two vectors. And what we typically denote it as rho of u v, so this would be the distance between vectors u and vectors v. All right. So again, just like before with the Euclidean norm, it has some properties that it must satisfy. So for any three vectors, u, v, and w, there must be symmetry. Now, it sounds complicated, but it's simple. The distance from u to v must be the distance from v to u. Makes sense. If I were to go from Edmonton to Calgary, that distance is going to be the same from Calgary to Edmonton. It should not change. If it does, then that's kind of weird. The second one is the triangular inequality, yet again. So the distance of u to w must be less than or equal to the distance from u to v and then from v to w. Remember, when we deal with vector addition, we're basically creating a triangle. It's basically saying that the hypotenuse has to be the largest side. Another one, too, is if the distance between two vectors is 0, they must be the exact same vector. There's no way that we can have vectors going in different directions and the distance be 0. The only way that's possible is if the vectors are identical. So again, there's a bunch of different types of these functions. There's a bunch of different norm functions. There's a bunch of different distance functions. But in this class, we're concerned with the Euclidean distance. How do we calculate it? Well, it's actually pretty simple. We're going to take one of the vectors, subtract the other, and then take the norm. So this is why we start with norm, because this allows us to get distance. Now, this actually simplifies into a nice formula that's almost identical to the norm function. If I want the distance between two vectors, all I need to do is go u1 minus v1 squared, then u2 minus v2 squared. So it's the exact same as the norm function. We're just subtracting the components of the second vector. Should be nice and easy. If I were to try and show you guys what exactly this means, let's take two vectors, 4, 1, and then u, which is 2, negative 1. I can find the distance between them as 2.828. What does this mean? Well, this means that the distance between the two heads of the vectors is 2.828. So have I lost you guys yet? Hopefully not. You guys are thinking this is, this is baby stuff, but you get to the good stuff. Well, the dot product. You guys remember the dot product? Yes. And this one is also very simple. So the Euclidean dot product is an example of an inner product function. So like I said before, there's different types of norm functions, and there's different types of distance functions. There's also what we call inner product functions. This attempts to give some sort of geometry to our vectors. Now, the most common example of an inner product function is the dot product. So the dot product is an example of an inner product function and is denoted as u dot with v. Now this is actually nice and simple because if we have two vectors, to dot them together, all we do is multiply the components together and then add them together. Now question for you guys, would this be a scalar or a vector? Scalar, exactly. So this will be a scalar. I always have to remember, or uh, remind the Antoine 30 kids because they always somehow create a vector. And I'm not even sure how with that formula. So in two and three dimensions, we use the dot product to relate geometric angles between two vectors. All right, so this is, again, what we're doing with this inner product function. We have two vectors, and now we're trying to use this function to define some sort of geometry between these two vectors. So if we were to look at this formulation, u dot v is equal to all the components multiplied by each other. Well, this is actually equal to the magnitude of the first vector 
multiplied by the magnitude of the second vector multiplied by cosine of theta. So this is where it gets important because we have this cosine of theta right there. We can now solve for the angle between two vectors. So I can just rearrange my formula over here. Now, if I were to give an example, we have our vector v, which is 4, 1, and u, which is 2, negative 1. I can go into that formula there, substitute everything in, and I get that my angle between them is 40.6 degrees. What does that mean physically? Well, it means that the angle between these two is going to be 40.6 degrees. Baby stuff. So now we're going to talk about some dot product properties, and these are basically related to the idea that the dot product is the angle between vectors, or is used to find the angle between vectors. So if two vectors are orthogonal or perpendicular to each other, u dot v is equal to zero. The dot product between them must be zero. Who knows why? Exactly. The angle between them, if we were to look at this formula, and they're orthogonal or perpendicular, well, the angle is going to be 90 degrees, perpendicular. Well, what's cosine of 90 degrees? Zero, exactly. So from there, we have a zero on the right-hand side. So then I can take this garbage at the bottom, throw it over, turns to zero. I get u dot v is equal to zero. Now, why is this important? Well, when we talk about the idea of those basis sets, those coordinate systems that we touched upon last lecture, what we want is something called an orthonormal basis set, which basically means that all of our axes are perpendicular to each other. So one question you guys will see all the time, I guarantee it'll be in the midterm, is, is this an orthonormal basis set? And I'm going to give you a bunch of vectors. How do you check if it's an orthonormal basis set? Well, you're going to dot all the vectors together, and you should get zero. If you dot them together and get zero, it means it's 90 degrees. That's what we want. The second one is a vector dotted with itself is equal to the magnitude of that vector squared. This one is very important when we start talking about proofs. That first lecture where we get into the good stuff, strain, this is going to appear, and this is going to be very critical to defining what we call the green string tensor, or the small string tensor. How is this proved? Well, if a vector is itself, what is the angle between those two vectors? Zero. It's the same vector. So in this case, we have theta is equal to zero, cosine of zero is one. I were to throw one onto the other side, I can take the stuff at the bottom, move it over, and I get u dot u is equal to the magnitude of u multiplied by the magnitude of u. Now, what is the magnitude of u? Is it a vector or is it a scalar? Scalar. So I'm basically taking a number and multiplying it with itself. So I can rewrite this as u dot u is equal to the magnitude or the norm of u squared. Pretty easy so far? Perfect. So let's talk about Euclidean vector spaces. Again, we have this idea that we have vector spaces, and each of these vector spaces must have these functions defined. Now, if we take our vector space and we define those three functions we talked about, the Euclidean norm, the Euclidean distance, and the Euclidean dot product, well, we now have a Euclidean vector space. Saying, Clayton, why do we care about this? Well, this allows us to take it a step further and create the definition of these four things. The orthonormal basis sets, orthogonal projections, cross product, as I know you guys love, and the triple product. So all of these, besides maybe orthonormal basis sets, you guys have seen before. Do you guys remember cross product? Yes. You guys remember triple product? It's basically the cross product one step further. You guys, when you see it, you'll know. Uh, orthogonal projections, just forget orthogonal. Do you guys remember projections? No? No, oh, N130 was not kind to you. All right, so let's go on to the first one. We're going to cover them all anyways. Orthonormal basis. So again, we talked about if we have a linearly independent set of vectors, they can form a basis set or a coordinate system. Now, is it the best coordinate system? Probably not. In order for it to be the most efficient, we want it to be an orthonormal basis set. Now, this is simple, because an orthonormal basis set has two properties, just two. The first one is all of the vectors have a unit norm. So if I want to define the x-axis, 
we know from the last lecture, I can define it as 5 comma 0. I said it would just be really, really long, but it's still valid. Well, that's not very efficient because we have to take things in multiples of 5. So what we want to do is we want to make sure that all of our vectors have a unit norm. So the best idea if I wanted to find an x-axis wouldn't be 5 comma 0, it'd be 1 comma 0. So what does this mean physically? Well, it means that all of the norms of our vectors must equal to 1. So again, very common exam question, is this an orthonormal basis set? The first thing you guys want to do is just check the component to make sure that the norm is equal to 1. It's very easy to tell if it's not. And we're going to go through some examples and you guys will really see what I mean. The second property is that all of the vectors that form the basis set are perpendicular or orthogonal to each other. This goes back to the dot product. What does this mean? It means that E1.E2 is equal to E1.E3, which is equal to E2.E3, which is equal to 0. So if you ever ask to define this orthonormal basis set or prove that it is, just make sure that all the vectors have a norm of 1 and all the vectors dotted with each other must equal 0. That's it. It's nice and easy. Some examples, well, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, and 0, 0, 1. If I were to draw this out, we get this system right here, which I'm sure that all of you guys have seen before. This is why we pick it. It's an orthonormal basis set. But it doesn't always have to be like this. Another example would be this set right here. If I were to go through these vectors, they all have a norm of 1. And if I were to dot them all together, I get 0. So it's valid. What would this look like? Well, it's kind of just rotating. And this is going to play a part with what we talked about a little bit later on the idea of a change of basis. Sometimes our coordinate system isn't the best. We have to rotate it to find the maximum stresses and the maximum strains. So that's going to be the basis sets. Now let's talk about projections. This is something that you guys have seen, and this is something as instructors, if we want to lower the average on a midterm, this is our go-to guy right here, projections. In Eng 130, it would kill everybody. So orthogonal projections of a vector u onto v can be determined as the components of a vector u in the direction of v. Now when I read stuff like that, I, I, I don't really know what that means. I, I'm not the best at looking at words describing it. What I like to do is I like to have pictures. So let's say I have this vector u with two components, u1 and u2. If I were to ask you guys for the components of this vector along the x-axis or the e1 axis, what's it going to be? u1. If I were to ask you guys the components of this vector along the vertical axis, what would it be? u2. That is the projection of this vector onto these axes. Now, what I mean with projections here is it doesn't always have to be along the x or the y axis. What I can do is I can give you guys another vector, which is v. And I say, what is the component of u onto v? So that's what a projection is. Again, this was in Eng 130. No one paid attention. It destroyed the average. So what I would be looking for is basically this component right here. How do we find it? Well, we use the dot product. So the projection of a vector u onto v, which I'm just going to call a, is equal to u dot v divided by the magnitude of v squared and then multiplied by v itself. I'm going to go over this in one of the examples we do, how exactly we get this formula. It's actually a pretty easy proof. Now, this vector a is parallel with v. So there's, there's the key here. The component is uh, parallel. Now, if I wanted this perpendicular component, we can see that we form a nice triangle. So in order to find it, all I have to do is go u minus a. It's just vector addition. So this vector b would be perpendicular to v. So let's do a quick example. If I wanted the orthogonal projection of u onto v, and I have my two vectors right here, all I have to do is substitute everything into the formula. The only thing that you guys really need to pay attention to is the wording, u onto v. If we were to change v onto u, the formula is going to change. So please be careful of the wording. That's the only really thing I've seen students mix up. So if I were to do that, I throw in all my numbers. This first part right here is a scalar. This is a vector. Scalar multiplied by a vector is going to give me a vector. This would be this vector right here. How are projections? Much better, much better. So you guys are smarter. That's the nice thing about seeing you guys in Edge 130 and seeing you guys now is 
before this would have blown your minds. But now you guys are like, come on, Clayton, let's get to the good stuff. So the last one is cross product. Uh, you guys all know cross product. But we're going to give it some additional properties. We did a very bad job in Engine 30 of saying, yeah, we use cross product for moments, and that's it. Well, what happens, and you guys probably seen this in Math 102, cross product is very, very special. It has a lot of things we can prove. If I were to take any sort of continuum mechanics, solid mechanics, fluid mechanics, finite element, any sort of simulation textbook, and go through the proofs, every single one is going to contain the cross product. And as you guys are going to see, when we talk about stresses and strains, in our proofs, we're going to be relying heavily on this cross product. So it's good to know. So cross product is a unique operation in R3 between two vectors u and v that returns another vector w. Now here's the key. w is perpendicular to both u as well as v. So notice the first thing here, I said it's a unique operation in R3. Three dimensions means my vector must have three components. Can I do a cross product with the two dimensional vector? No. Can't do a cross product with any sort of two dimensional vector. How about a four dimensional vector? I'm seeing a lot of. The answer is no. So do you think the cross product only applies to R3? doesn't apply to R2, doesn't apply to R4. It's actually really weird. For some reason, the cross product can also be applied to R7. I don't know why, just a little fun fact. But again, in this course, we're keeping it practical. No one cares about R7. So we're going to look at R3, and we say, OK, if I have two vectors, u and v, and I were to cross them together, my resultant is going to be perpendicular to both of them. That's kind of what we finish at end 30. So that's, that's the property we want. That's all we're going to finish with. But this actually has a lot more properties that are very special. If I wanted the components, I can just write them as a vector like this. Now, do you guys remember how to get the components using cross product? You guys remember the formula? No? <laughs> Mine's a little bit controversial. So I'll, I'll wait till the end of class when I can just cut the video <laughs> to show you guys. So this is going to be a vector. And I'll show you guys how to get this a little bit later. But for now, you just need to know it's a vector. So the first one, again, is w is going to be perpendicular to the plane created by u and v. When we talk about the stress tensor, this is going to become very important. Another property, though, is that if we were to look at these two vectors, they create a parallelogram. You guys can see that? So one property we didn't discuss in Engine 30 that's very important is the area of this parallelogram is actually equal to the norm of this resultant vector. That's a fun one. That might be in an exam. So let's look at some properties. First one, I've said it a thousand times already, the resultant vector w is perpendicular to u and v. So, oh, the animations didn't really work. So again, if we're talking about perpendicular, it means if I were to dot the resultant vector with two of the input vectors, I should get zero because they're perpendicular. The other one is the operation is skew symmetric. So this is going to be something we're going to talk about, not next lecture, but the lecture after, the idea of skew symmetric. If we were to take two products and dot, uh, two vectors and dot them together, u dot with v, not cross, but dot, is that the same as v dot with u? Yes, it doesn't matter the order, because we're just multiplying the components. For the cross product, does the order matter? Yes. But it's actually, as you guys will see, if you guys get the order wrong, you'll have the exact same numbers. The numbers will be correct, but they'll all be opposite in sign. So this is actually called skew symmetric, where I can write this. U cross with V is actually equal to negative V cross with U. All right, so it's, it's almost the same. We just have to include that negative sign there. That's skew symmetric. We're going to talk about skew symmetric tensors a lot uh, moving forward. And the operation is distributed over addition, so we can do one of these fun things. It's also compatible with scalar multiplication. Again, another little fun fact. And then this one, which is basically just relating it with dot product. Uh, I'm not going to be like trying to screw you guys over in the exam with all these fancy properties at the bottom. The only two things I really want you guys to take away here is that A, 
it's going to be perpendicular to this plane, and B, the magnitude of it is going to be the area of the plane. Those are two that we use a lot in proofs, which is why I want you guys to really absorb that. So let's look at some scenarios. If I were to have E1 and E2 and cross them together, what am I going to get? Well, let's put it this way. If I had the x-axis and the y-axis, and I were to cross them together, what should I get? The z-axis, exactly. So it's going to be like this. Now, why do I go plus or minus? It's because, again, the order matters. It matters if I'm going from E1 to E2 or the other way around. I don't know what exactly these are, so I can't make any sort of conclusions. Uh, if we were to look at this, though, it's pretty easy to tell using the right-hand rule. If I were to go from E1 over to E2, my axis should be pointing this way. If I were to go E2 over to E1, my thumb is pointing the other way. So if I were to have the y-axis and the z-axis crossing together, which I get? X-axis. And then finally, if I were to go X and Z, I should get Y. Should be some nice fun stuff for you guys. Now, the cross product of linearly dependent vectors. What should the cross product of linearly dependent vectors be? What do you guys think? This is going to be a fun fact. Who wants to take a guess? No one? The cross product of two linearly dependent vectors is zero. And this goes back to the idea, again, that the magnitude of the resultant should be the area of that plane, right? The area of the plane created. If I were to have two linearly dependent vectors, they can be righted in this form. So if I were to look at this, am I creating a parallelogram between these two? No, there is no area. So this occurs with three different occasions. One vector is equal to zero, the other vector is equal to zero, or u is a linear combination of v. Easy way to see this again, we don't create any sort of parallelogram. This goes back to the other property. If I were to dot a vector, or sorry, cross a vector with the zero vector, what should that be equal to? If I were to take a vector and cross it with the zero vector, what should it be equal to? Zero, exactly. Because if I were to have the zero vector, it's basically just a dot. Again, we're not creating any sort of parallelogram. So that's why I like to show the parallelogram, because it's very easy to see all these cross-product related proofs. So now we're going to move on to the triple, or what we sometimes call it the scalar product. This is something that you guys have seen before. You guys just don't know it. You guys remember in inch 130 where we had i, j, k, and then the position vector? But remember we said that there is a way to also multiply in i, j, and k to get a determinant? Well, that is basically the triple or scalar product. So it's the volume of the parallel pipe created by the vectors u, v, and w, which is this. So I can take u, and then I can dot it with v cross w. So again, this is the exact same formula we had in inch 130. We just had i, j, and k. So all we're doing is instead of i, j, and k, we actually have numbers. So once we get this vector component, we multiply it by u. Once we get this vector component, we multiply it by u2. Once we get this vector component, we multiply it by u3. So it's, again, it's something that you guys have seen before. You guys just haven't really applied it. And in some exam situations, you're going to have to use this. And I'll show you guys when, but not right now. So it has some properties. And they are basically just gross. The last two are the ones I would probably want you guys to know. If u, v, and w are linearly dependent, this is equal to 0. One of the reasons why, that you guys can see very simply, if we said that they're linearly dependent, this cross product must equal 0. Another one is if u, v, and w are orthonormal, all perpendicular to each other, the cross product must equal plus or minus 1. Now, this idea of plus or minus 1 is going to come uh, back a lot later on, but we're not going to talk about it too much right now. 
So this is uh, the end of this. We have two slides on change of basis, but let's do some examples because I can see you guys are falling asleep. So the quiz itself is composed of three questions, each dealing with one of those formulas that we just discussed in the theory. So the first question says, consider R2. So by R2, it means two dimensions. With the Euclidean norm, and then it shows the formula for the Euclidean norm as follows. And it says, how many vectors have, and then part A says, a norm of equal to 1. So norm equal to 1, well, that means the length of the vector must be equal to 1. So let's look at this, uh, kind of this grid here. And let's just put, for fun, oops, I did the eraser. You guys will see me do that lots. So for fun, let's just uh, put some labels. So let's say we got 1, 1. On this side, we got negative 1. And then over here, we also have negative 1. So how many vectors have this length? Well, if we're starting from the origin here, and actually, let's put this as a, let's go, oop, red is the same as the origin. That won't help. All right, let's go blue. So if I were to have a vector that goes from here to here, we know that this itself has length 1. We can just tell visually that that has length 1. Uh, we can have another vector that goes straight up. So from the origin straight up here. And we can tell visually that these ones have length 1. And we can quickly verify that because if I were to do the coordinate points of this vector, it goes 0 in the horizontal axis and 1 up. So if I were to come over here, the magnitude of this vector, which uh, let's just call x, is going to be equal to the square root of x1 squared. So we got 0 squared plus, and then x2 squared, and in this case it's 1, so plus 1 squared. So if we type all that into our calculator, or at least I hope you're not using a calculator at this point, we get 1. So this one's good to go. And similarly, we can do the same for the blue vector. So over here, we know that this coordinate point goes 1 in the horizontal, but no vertically, so it's going to be 1, 0. So if I were to do the magnitude of this one, and we'll call this one y, and yes, this will get very confusing if I keep up this notation. And I guess I should put the, the kind of the double absolute signs on here. All right, so going back to the blue vector, we can go equals to the square root and the first component squared, so we got one squared, plus the second component squared, so we have zero squared, and throw that into our calculator, and we get one. And yes, I know it sounds silly throwing it into your calculator, but on an exam, I'd probably do that for some unknown reason. So we gave two examples of where it has length of one. However, we still have the question, how many vectors, how many possible combination of vectors have this? Well, if we're looking at purely just length one, what we can do is actually, if we were to draw a circle all the way around, and yes, hopefully this will autocorrect a little bit better, we can have infinite number of vectors with length 1. For example, if I were to go to green, I can have this vector right here. It's going to be a combination of x1 and x2, but it'll still have length 1. Oops, didn't mean to zoom in like that. I can come down here, and again, this will also have length 1. So basically, you can go all the way around that circle with every vector having length 1. So for this one right here, there's actually an infinite amount of vectors that have length 1. All right, so going down, we have now norm equals 2. So the magnitude is 2. And just like before, what we can do is we can draw a circle all the way around. So we're going to go all the way to these points. And, oh, that doesn't look good at all. But at least the iPad kind of has my back and made it look a little bit better. All right, so that's not bad. So in this case, this right here is 2. Uh, we'll have 2 up here. We'll have negative 2. And then we'll have 2 down here. And just like before, we can have vectors going in any direction. So we can have one coming up like this. We can have, let's say, one going perfectly horizontal. We can even have one going horizontally in the other direction, like this. So just like before, for norm is equal to 2, there's actually infinite uh, vectors or possibilities. There's an infinite amount of vectors that could have norm is equal to 2. And if I were to prove one really quick, well, we know that for this horizontal one, we know that it goes two horizontally and then zero going across. So if we were to put this into our formula, so we go the norm of x is equal to the square root of the first component squared. So we got two squared 
plus the second component squared, so 0 squared, put the square root over top, what we get is this is going to be equal to 2. And yes, I know I'm being really lazy picking the horizontal and vertical vectors, but let's be honest, that's how uh, <laughs> that's how you get the good grades. Anything lazy works perfectly. A grade is still a grade, a mark is still a mark. Who cares, as long as you get there. So now, the final part of the question is kind of the most interesting one. How many vectors have the norm zero? And as you guys know, I didn't draw a grid because this one's kind of a unique case. So for this one, what we're going to do is we're going to look strictly at the formula. So if we were to go, the norm of x is equal to the square root. And remember, we're only sticking in two dimensions. It's going to be x1 squared plus x2 squared. So if we look really quick, both of those components are squared. So no matter what, those are both going to be positive values in, uh, in the squares. So the only way that this equation will ever equal to 0 there's only one possible solution. It's x1 is equal to x2, which is equal to 0. So for this case, there's only one vector, one vector with norm 0, so one vector. And in this case, it's the 0 vector. And this is the only vector that will ever have norm or a magnitude of zero. And that can just be proven by looking at the math. The only way that equation is going to equal zero is if x1 is equal to x2, which is zero. All right, so moving on, we have consider r2 again. So again, we're sticking with two dimensions, but now we're going to talk about Euclidean distance. So the formula right there is x minus y. How many vectors have x minus y is equal to one? Well, just kind of like before, there's going to be an infinite amount of vectors. Now, how can we pick one of these vectors? Well, it's pretty simple. All I want to do to make this really easy for myself is let's say I have a point here, or sorry, yeah, let's say we have this point, and this point is located at 1. And we want the distance between two points to be 1. So if we know this point right here, uh, I know that the scale of the graph is going to be off, but if this point is 2, we know that this distance from here to here is equal to 1, right here. So all we have to do is say, OK, well, this will be vector 1, this orange 1. And this one right here, if just looking by, it doesn't even matter what y is, because what we'll have is we'll just put y. So the, the coordinates of this point are 1, comma y. And we have the second vector, which will go from here over to here. And the coordinates of this one are 2 comma y. So again, as you guys will see, I'm kind of cheating with this. If I were to plug these values into the, the formula below, so if I were to go uh, row, this is how I do row. I know I put a little tail that everyone thinks is kind of weird. So we know that this is going to be equal to the square root of x1 minus y1 squared. So in this case, it doesn't matter which one you pick because they're both going to cancel. So let's start with the orange one. So let's say 1 minus 2 squared and then plus the second components minus each other. And in this case, if they're both at y, what's going to happen is we're going to have y minus y squared. And if I put this over top, just finish off the square root, throw that in, well, the y minus y squared, well, that's just 0 squared. So this kind of cancels out. We're left with negative 1 squared, which is 1, and then the square root of 1 is 1. So in this case, row of x and y is going to be equal to 1. And if we go up, well, yes, that's what we're looking for. So perfect. And again, there's infinite amount of combinations. So instead of doing a horizontal one like this, what I could have done is I could have picked a point, let's say, point here and a point here and the distance between these two like this is going to be equal to 1. So let's say that these values are at uh, negative 1 and then down here is negative 2 and then this is the value x and then I could have just made two more vectors. So like something going like this and then I could have had a second one going downwards like this. And you can do this kind of rotating this all the way around the coordinate system. So again, there's going to be infinite vectors for this case. 
So infinite vectors. All right. So the second part of the question, how many vectors have a distance of 0? Well, again, we have to look at the formula for this one. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write the formula really quick. So x minus y is equal to, and I don't think I left myself a, <laughs> enough room for that, but we go x1 minus y1 squared plus x2 minus y2 squared. So if we look at this formula, what we need is we need x1 minus y1 to equal 0, and same on the other side. So the only way that this is going to happen is if the vectors are in the exact same position. So let's say I got vector 1 coming like this, right here, and its points are x, comma y. Well, the only time that the distance between these two vectors are going to be 0 is if they're the same vector. So my second vector would also kind of overlap over top here and be the same one. And that you guys can very quickly visually see that, yes, the distance between those two vectors is going to be 0. They overlap each other at the end. But now we have to ask ourselves, how many combinations of vectors have the distance between, between them equal to 0? And like before, there's actually an infinite amount, infinite vectors. And the only reason is, is because I could have two overlapping vectors like I did above, or let's say I can have them down here, something like this, where I have the first one, and then I have the second one. So as you guys can see, I can just rotate those two vectors all the way around the, the coordinate system to give myself infinite amount of vectors. So that's how many vectors have uh, Euclidean distance of zero. So now we're going to start getting into the fun stuff. So it says consider R3. So now we're talking about three dimensions with the Euclidean dot product. Find three vectors perpendicular to, and then the first one, I guess, is this x is equal to 1, 0, 0. So perpendicular. So something is perpendicular. If I have two vectors, and the best way I can uh, do this is to draw. So let's say that I have a vector here like this, and then I have a second vector that comes out like this, we know that in order for these two to be perpendicular to each other, the angle must be 90 degrees. So theta is equal to 90 degrees. And if we look back at our dot product, remember we have x dot y is equal to the magnitude of x multiplied by the magnitude of y times cosine of theta. Now, if we throw 90 degrees into here, so for theta equals 90, this actually cancels out because cosine of 90 is 0. So if two vectors are perpendicular, what we say is that x dot y is equal to 0. And that's why I said that the cosine of theta is so important in this case. So if we were to expand our vector out, so let's say that we just assume our vector, so we just assume our vector y is going to be equal to, and we're just going to put y1, comma y2, comma y3. If I were to do x dot y, so I'll, I'm going to do this in different colors just to kind of make it a little bit brighter. So we got x dot y is going to be equal to, so it's going to be x1, which we see up there is 1, so we're going to have 1, times y1, which we're just going to put as y1, plus x2, which is 0, times y2. And then finally, we have x3, which is also 0, times y3. And all this, to be perpendicular, must be equal to 0. So from here, it's really, really easy to see that no matter if I were to look at these two, the y2 and the y3, it doesn't matter what those are because if we're multiplying them by 0, they'll be 0. The only limiting factor we have to consider is this y1. So for a vector to be perpendicular, we just need that y1 to be 0. And y2 and y3 could be anything else. So if I were to just look at vectors, I can say, uh, let's go y is equal to as long as the first one we go 0, and we can put any other numbers. So we can go 5, comma 6, 
we can go y is equal to, remember the first one's 0, and we can do anything, so we can go 1 comma negative 2, and then a third one would be y is equal to 0 comma, let's go 3 comma 5. So these are all perpendicular because if we were to substitute these values in, we got x dot y is equal to 0. So as long as that y1 is 0, y2 and y3 could be anything that they want. And now this one is kind of even more interesting, where it's x is equal to 0, 0, 0. So again, it wants a perpendicular. So if we were to go x dot y, assuming y is just equal to y1, y2, y3, we got 0 times y1 plus 0 times y2 plus 0 times y3. And if they're perpendicular, this must be equal to 0. So since we have zeros in all three parts of these right here, it doesn't matter what y1, y2, or y3 are. And if y2, y1, and y3 can be anything, that means that any vector possible, so any vector uh, dot with the zero vector will be perpendicular. So from this case right here, we have an infinite amount of vectors that when we dot it with the zero vector will give a perpendicular vector because it doesn't matter. So if I were to go up to the top really quick, let's just say I go y1 is equal to 6, y2 is equal to 4, and then y3 is equal to, let's just say, 3. Well, 0 times 6, that's going to be 0. 0 times 4, that's going to be 0. And then 0 times 3, that's going to be 0. And if I sum all three of these up, well, what do you know? It's equal to 0, meaning it's perpendicular. So that's it for the quiz. Again, hopefully a lot of it was just nice review from Eng130. At least that's what I'm counting on. Uh, again, the only thing that's really different was the terminology. But once you guys get the new terminology down, it's a, it's a piece of cake. And as you guys can see from the calculations, they're pretty simple. And this is what to expect on the midterm. So if the calculations are easy here, hopefully they'll be easy on the midterm and you guys will all be happy with your, uh, with your good marks. So that concludes uh, quiz number four. In quiz number five, we're going to continue on with some uh, a bit more advanced operations. So I will see you guys in quiz number five. So this quiz is relatively short. We only have two examples. And the first one says, let x is equal to 1, 1, and s equal to 1, 0. Determine the orthogonal projection of s onto x. So this question is nice for you guys, because if you guys get this in exam, it's just straight up plugging in numbers into the formula, nice and easy. But the trick with this one is always the terminology. So it's very important to, to, <laughs> to identify what's being projected onto what. So in this case, I'm going to highlight it here. It wants the projection of s onto x. Now it's going to be very important because that influences what numbers we substitute into our formula. So if this is the case and we have s onto x, what this is, if we substitute in the formula, this will be the projection of x. So we have x at the bottom, sorry, projection of s onto x. So x goes on the bottom and s goes up here. So what I would do is into the midterm or the final, I'd bring a formula sheet and I would just show what vectors go into where. Because after this, it's pretty easy just to substitute the rest in the formula. So this is going to be equal to, and I'm going to put a bracket, x dot s divided by the magnitude, or I guess in this case, or in this course, the norm of x squared, and then all multiplied by x. So I, everything in this, actually I'll put this here so you guys can see. So everything right here, this is going to just be a scalar right here. So this is a scalar, just a regular number. And then this x right here, this is going to be a vector we multiply the scalar by right there. So again, I told you, I explained it very, very poorly in the theory. So this is a better way to show you exactly what's happening. So basically, we have kind of two things that are going on. We have a vector that we know is x, and I'm going to put this in a different color. So let's say that we have a vector right here that's x. x right here. And then we also have a second vector coming up, and this right here, this is going to be s. So what this formula gives us is it gives us the orthogonal projection of s onto x, and that's another vector, and I guess we'll do this one in yellow. So if I were to make a line that crosses the x vector perpendicular, so this is 90 degrees right here, 
what this projection is, is this is the vector of s that runs along the same direction as x. So this right here, this would be the projection of x on s. And the formula itself is pretty easy to prove. So I'll do it really quick. So if we know the angle theta between these two vectors, then basically all we can do is treat this as a right triangle because we have a 90 degree angle. We can do a nice right triangle. So we know that projection, projection of xs, so this is what we're looking for. Well, this is going to be equal to the magnitude of s times cosine of theta. So this is just from trigonometry, because if I look up here, well, if this is s, then this length from here to here, that's going to be the magnitude, or I guess the norm of s. So see, even you guys know that in this course, I'm getting the terminology mixed up. So we go with the magnitude of s times cosine of theta. So that's just treating it as a right triangle. We also know that cosine of theta is equal to the dot product divided by the magnitude of the two vectors. So now we got the magnitude of s right here. So that just comes from before. But then cosine theta, we can swap that out with x dot s divided by the magnitude of x and the magnitude of s. So like this. And then we can see here really quick that I can take my pink cancellation marker and I can cross the two s's. So just from this alone, what we end up with is projection of x onto s is equal to x dot s divided by the magnitude of x. And then someone you're going to say, hey, Clayton, hold up one second. This formula that you have right here that you just highlighted, that's not the same as up here. And you're right, it's not. Because if we look at this formula right here, and we look at what we did to the triangle, we treated everything as a scalar. The magnitude of s right here, that's a scalar. And then, we're t and then the theta, that's just a triangle. So in the end, this projection of x on s, that's just the scalar of it. This is the scalar portion. So to make this scalar turn into a vector, we're going to have to times it by the direction of the, whatever we want the vector to be. So in this case, we want the direction of x. So to get that, what we do is we take x, the vector, and we divide it by x. So if you guys remember from edge 130, this right here is the unit vector. So this is the unit vector of x. unit vector x and we would put an edge 130 as u i guess x and what that is is that's the direction of x so from this formula we have the first part which is kind of the scalar and then we're multiplying it by the unit vector which is the direction and if we substitute everything in to this what we find is we get the exact same formula as above because we've got x dot s divided by the norm of x squared because I just put those in any times by x. So it's exactly the same as we get from the formula above here. That's kind of the quick proof. You guys don't really need to know proofs. Don't worry about it. Unless you guys get into solid mechanics, then yes, Dr. Samer loves throwing proofs all over the midterm and finals. But for this case, you guys will be fine. So for this class, all you're expected to do is say, okay, here's the formula. And we have our values. So all we have to do is just input them in. So I'm going to come down here. I'm going to have the projection of xs is equal to, and the first thing that we're going to want is that dot product. So we're going to take the first component of x times by the first component of s. So we got 1 multiplied by 1. So I come down here and I go, OK, it's going to be 1 times 1 and then plus, And we're going to do the second component times the second component. So in this case, we're going to have 1 times 0. So I come down here and I go, OK, we got 1 times 0. And then at the bottom, we have the magnitude of x squared, or the norm. So remember, for the, the norm, what we do is we do that nice uh, formula with the square root. So it's going to be the first component squared times the second component squared. So again, I'm going to erase the s because in this case, we're looking at the magnitude or the norm of x. We're looking at these values right here. So the first and second component are both equal to 1. So what we're going to have right here is we're going to have 1 squared plus 1 
squared. I'm going to put this over top like this. And I'm going to put this in brackets because this is the norm. But what we have is we have the norm squared. So this right here, everything in pink right here, which I'll put a giant bracket around. Ooh, that did not work out well. I'm going to put this in bracket right here because I want to make this clear that everything right here, this right here is just going to be a scalar. So I'm going to put in brackets, scalar. And then we multiply that by the vector x. In this case, this is just 1, 1. So it's easy to go through here. And if we do the calculations, that scalar value, well, 1 times 1 is 1. So we're going to have 1 at the top plus 1 times 0. So that's 0. So at the very top, we're going to have 1. Uh, the bottom, we have, and I guess I should highlight this, we have 1 plus 1. So we got 2, the square root of 2. But then we square it, so we get 2. So in the end here, we get 2. And that's just doing mental math. What I'm going to hint to you guys, just use your calculator. That's the easy way to go. Don't be like me. Use your calculator. I get the worst mistakes. In uh, one of my exams, my 395 exam, I put that pi times pi is 2 pi. And I'll never forget it. And after that, I use a calculator for everything. 1 plus 3, I don't know. Throw in the calculator. That's what matters. So what we have here is we have 1 half times the vector x. So in the end, this is going to be 1 over 2, 1 over 2. And in the uh, quiz itself, it called this vector z. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put z is equal to, and then in this case, we just know it's going to be 1 half, comma, 1 half. Nice and easy. And again, I guess you, the multiple choice questions, can't, you can't really box your answer. <laughs> I guess you'll circle your answer in that case. But uh, it's always good to box your answer if you're ever doing a written exam. So that's the first question here. The second question, nice multiple choice question, and get used to multiple choice. The midterm and the final, all multiple choice. It can make life easy, but sometimes it can make it a living hell, <laughs> depending on uh, how close the answers are together. So for this one, it says, let u and v be vectors in R3. If the cross product of u and v is equal to the zero vector, then a, u is equal to zero, b, v is equal to zero, C, u is equal to alpha times v, where alpha is some scalar, and then d, any of the above. So there's kind of two ways of tackling this question. The first is thinking about the theory. Well, the theory kind of sucks. So what I'm going to hint to you guys is just substitute values into the formula. So if you guys remember the formula for the vector, it's going to be and even I don't really remember, I'm going to have to think about it. It's going to be x2, y3, minus x3, y2. So this is going to be the first component, comma. And then I guess the next one would be x1, y3, minus x3, y1, and then comma. And then the last one, I guess, would be x1, y2, minus x, 2, y, 1. All right, so if I were to do uh, x, I guess this is going to look terrible, x cross y, this is what I'm going to get. So what I like to do in this question, because it's multiple choice, you don't have to show any work, you don't have to prove anything, just substitute values. So if u is equal to 0, then this means that this is going to be 0, then this will be 0, then this will be 0, then this will be 0, and so on, crossing them all out. And if we look, every term in this equation is multiplied by 0. So if this is the case where I'm going to put x is equal to 0, but in this case I'm doing, uh, let me just erase this, make it even easier. Let's go x is equal to 0. So if x is equal to 0, then yes, x cross y is going to equal to 0. So this one right here, this is an absolute check. Now, what I can do is I can erase this and say, OK, well, I just made all the x's equal to 0. What happens if I make all the y's equal to 0? So I'm just going to erase this for clarity. So instead, I'm going to go here, and I'm going to say, uh, let's do this in yellow. So now we got y is equal to 0. Well, if this is the case, then yes, this is equal to 0. This is going to be equal to 0. This will equal to 0. This will equal to 0, and then so on and so on. And yes, 
we can see that every term is multiplied by 0. So if y is equal to 0, then x cross y is equal to 0. So this one also gets a check mark. And if we look right here, well, we have two answers that are already correct. So if we're looking at this from a multiple choice perspective, it would have to be D any any of the above right away, just because the first two answers work. Alrighty, guys, sorry for the weird cut. I was just going to tell you guys to play it simple, just circle D and move on. But since this is a video tutorial and I got nothing but time on my hands, let's explore option C really quick, which is X is equal to alpha times Y, where alpha is any scalar value. Let's explore this one because this is actually a really interesting case. By the look of it, a lot of people would say, no, no way this can equal the zero vector, but let's find out. So to explore this one, all we're going to do is we're just going to explore the first term of the vector right here, you know, kind of keep it nice and easy to ourselves. And if we can prove it here, then it's actually easy to prove everywhere else. So we'll do this proof in pink. So originally we have x2 times y3 minus x3 times y2. Two. So this is directly taken from the formula above. But now we know, and I'll put this in a different color, we know that x2 is actually equal to alpha times y2. And then we also know that x3 is actually equal to alpha times y3. So what we're going to do, well, we're going to substitute those in. So instead of x2, we're going to have alpha y2, and now that's times by y3 minus alpha y3 times y2. So it's easy to see that basically this right here is going to be a number, and on the other side it's going to be a number, but they have the exact same components, alpha y2, y3. And on the other side, alpha y3, y2, but the order doesn't matter because we're multiplying them together. So in the end, yes, this will be equal to 0, and it's the exact same for every other component. So if I wanted to, I could have checked this, said, yes, this is also correct. But remember, in an exam, go fast. So once you get A and B are proven, well, you just circle D, move on. I just thought, you know, I got the time. Might as well show you. So nice, easy quiz. Again, this should be the end of review. Get ready for uh, <laughs> the next quiz when we talk about basis. Things start to change a lot. Uh, for the better, uh, most of it, but... I guess that'll be up for you guys to decide. So thank you guys all so much for listening. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you guys in quiz number six. Uh, change of basis. So this is going to be the last thing on your guys' uh, assignment this week. That confused a lot of you guys. So the components of a vector depend on the set of basis vectors. Clayton, what do you mean by this? In some scenarios, we want to transform the coordinate system. So let's say that this was our coordinate system. We have E1 and E2. And if we were to just look at this, we can intuitively see that E1 is 1, 0, and E2 is 0, 1. Typical x, y axis. And if I were to take my vector here, u, we can say that it has components 3 and components 2. Now these components depend on where our coordinate system is. So if I were to take my coordinate system now, I'm not touching u. Red vector, I'm just going to leave it. If I were to just solely take my coordinate system E1 and E2 and transform it into this, again, this U stayed the exact same. All I did was I rotated E1 and E2 to get E1 prime and E2 prime. Do the components of U now change? Exactly. In this particular case, if I went from 3, 2 and I rotated it, I would get something like this. And the amount or the, the change here depends on how much I actually rotate it. So the key here in change of basis, everything stays the same. I'm just rotating the coordinate system. Now again, I like to keep things practical. When would I ever use this? Yes? Exactly. So this is where Civi 270 comes back and says hello. You guys remember more circle? How if you start rotating the circle, all the stresses change, and then you want to find the situation where it's just principal stresses and no shear stresses? That's why we do this. What you guys are going to see is we're going to get a stress tensor or a stress matrix that is defined in this coordinate system. 
But what we do is then we rotate the coordinate system to find out when that matrix is maximum. Because those are the stresses we want to design for. If I were to find my stresses in this system are 10 MPA, and I designed for 12, and I'm thinking I'm good, well, you guys may have a problem once you find out that the principal stresses are actually 15 MPA. Then you guys will be in court. No one wants to be in court. Well, except maybe jury duty. I thought that would be fun. I'm not sure, though. Has anyone done jury duty? No? Oh, hopefully one day. I'm curious. All right. So the question that I want to try and post to you guys, and this can be on the assignment, how exactly do we go from here over to here? Typically in these questions, there will be one of two scenarios. In both scenarios, I will give you you. I'll give you the original vector. And what I would want you guys to do is find Q and then determine U prime. Q, as we're going to see, as long as you know the amount of rotation, it's very easy to determine. Very, very easy. So that's going to be the one scenario. I give you the amount of rotation as an angle, let's say 60 degrees. You solve for Q, and then you can solve for U prime. The second case, which is on the assignment, I give you guys U. I give you guys U prime, so you have both of those. I ask you for how much did we actually rotate our system. But before we do that, you guys need to answer this question. If I have U and I want U prime, how do I calculate it? This goes back to the idea of linear maps. We have an input, we have a linear map, and now we have an output. So this is just matrix multiplication. If I wanted U prime, I'm just taking my linear map Q, which is going to be a matrix, and multiplying it by my vector U. So this is the first thing you guys need to know for that last question of the assignments. How do I get U prime? Well, I just take my linear map and multiply it by the inputs. Nice and simple. The question is, what exactly is Q? I know it's going to depend on theta, but how exactly do we get it? So Q, in general, is called the coordinate transformation matrix. There's going to be two types of matrices that deal with these coordinate transformations, a rotation as well as a reflection matrix. As you guys may have guessed in the previous slide, that was a rotation matrix. The components of it, so QIJ, so the ith row in the jth column, can be determined using the dot product. So this right here is the dot product. And it depends on the basis sets. So we're going to take EI prime and dot it with EJ. So if I wanted Q11, I would take E1 prime and dot it with E1. And I'm going to show you guys how exactly we do this. So let's do a counterclockwise rotation. I'm saying counterclockwise because in your assignments, it's clockwise. First problem I have is students will see this Q matrix at the bottom that's going to be shown. They're going to throw it into the assignment and say, Clayton, I got it wrong, but I followed everything correctly. I'll say, no, you didn't. Remember, the assignment is clockwise, but for here we have counterclockwise. So this is going to be our original basis set, 1, 0, and 0, 1. And we are going to rotate it counterclockwise. So we're going to get something like this. Now notice that the basis set stays perpendicular with each other. So that means that the angle between E1 and E1 prime is going to be theta, and the angle between E2 and E2 prime is also going to be theta. You guys see that so far? Perfect. So if I'm looking at this formula, in order to find Q, I need the components of both E1 and E2, but I have those, we're good to go, as well as E1 prime and E2 prime, but I don't exactly have those. So the first thing I want to do is figure out what is going to be these two components. How do I do that? Well, I create triangles. You'll see a lot of this course is just creating triangles. So what I can do is I can create a triangle right here. This is going to be a right angle. And we know that E1 prime, the length of this, is equal to 1. We can determine that directly from here. This is going to be 1, so the hypotenuse is 1. And what we want to do is we want to find this x component right here. Well, if I know this is theta and the hypotenuse is 1, it's going to be 1 multiplied by cosine theta. Make sense? If I were to do the other side and say, OK, I now have the x, but I want the y component right here, well, I'm going to take the hypotenuse 1 and now multiply it by sine theta. So I get e1 prime is equal to cosine theta sine theta. Make sense? So as we can see, as we start to rotate it, 
more and more, E1 is going to change more and more. If I were to look at my second triangle that I can create going this way, it's going to be the exact same thing, but there's going to be one trick. If I were to look here and say, okay, well now I know this is one, and I want this vertical component, or sorry, this horizontal component right here, I know I'm going to use sine. But one thing that we intuitively have to see is that now our axis is shifting into the negative side. Do you guys see that? Instead of going this way, it's now going the other way. So that's why we have negative 1 times sine theta. We get negative sine. If I want the uh, vertical component, I just take cosine, multiply it by uh, 1, I get cosine theta. So is it clear how I got these two things? Perfect. When you guys do the counterclockwise rotation, it's the same process, but now you're just going oops, <laughs> the other way. So hopefully that makes sense. So now that I have all these components, I can figure out what my components are. If I wanted Q11, it's going to be E1 prime dotted with E1. So cosine theta times 1, cosine theta, plus sine theta times 0, 0. So I get cosine of theta. I can do that with Q22, and I can do it with every other component. And what I get is Q for counterclockwise rotation is going to be this matrix right here. So now that I know this, and I know what my u is, and if I know what theta is, I can solve for u prime. In the example, or sorry, in the assignment, I give you u, so let's go back. I give you u prime, I give you u, and I ask for theta. If we remember what q is, the only unknown in q is theta. So you basically have your system of equations right here. So is there any questions about change of basis? No? Good, you guys are still nice and happy. Perfect. So that's the lecture notes. Let's go to an example. All right, so the question says, consider the basis set B prime, which is composed of E1 prime and E2 prime, where the new basis vectors are rotated 60 degrees counterclockwise from the original basis vectors E1 and E2. Let U equal U1 E1 plus U2 E2, which is equal to 2 E1 plus 3 E2. Determine the components of U prime and the new basis system. So to get a better understanding really quick of what exactly we're doing, let's just draw a little diagram. So originally what we have is something like this. Let's say, oh, I should probably actually draw this right in the center because I will look like an idiot if I don't. So let's just say that these are our original basis vectors, E1 and E2, something like this. So we got E1 and we got E2. And if they're orientated in such a way like this, we know that E2 is going to be 0, 1, and E1 is going to be 1, 0, something like this. And in this current basis system, we have a vector u. And the vector is going to come out, let's say, uh, it's higher than this, so let's say it goes something like this. So this right here is going to be u, not to scale, of course. And if it says that u1 e1 plus u2 e2 is equal to 2 e1 plus 3 e2, it's very easy to see that u is going to be 2 comma 3. So this is what we originally have. And then, you know, they say, okay, this is great, but let's change that basis. You know, keep students on their toes, something like that. So instead of having this system, what it wants us to do is calculate the components of u if we switch the system to this right here. So we have, this is our new E1. And then on the other side, we have E2, something like this. I'm gonna try and make it look nice. I'm not an artist, please uh, please be nice to me if uh, you don't like it. So this is E2. And since these are our new coordinate system, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put prime. So this is our new basis right here, this E1 prime, E2 prime. And the angle between the new basis system and the original one is angle theta, which we're given is 60 degrees. So the whole goal of this question is basically saying, okay, well, we had u in the original basis and it had coordinates two, three. Now, when we rotate our basis system, what are the new components of u? So in order to do this, we go to the nice formula that we're given before, where it says the coordinates u prime are gonna be equal to a matrix Q times the original uh, components u. And 
luckily for you guys, I gave I gave you this nice formula. And remember, if it's a midterm, just use the formulas. Write it down. It's an open book test. Use those formulas. Go really fast because that's what it's about. We're not testing you on the theory. <laughs> Unless you go to grad school, then yes, the theory will be very important. But as I remember saying, for this particular scenario where we're just rotating the system, our Q is going to be equal to cosine of theta. So cosine of theta. And the next component is going to be sine theta. And then at the bottom, we have negative sine theta. And then finally, we have cosine theta. And again, this is easy to prove. And after we get the answer, if you guys want to stick around, I'll show you guys exactly how I got those values. So we're going to have that right there. And we're going to multiply by the vector u. So on this side right here, we'd have the vector u, which is 2, 3, just like this. So and I'll pull this down. So something like this. So in this case right here, we're given that our theta, so I'm going to highlight this part right here, Oh, that did not work. Hold on a second, guys. Technical difficulties, of course. So this part right here, the only thing we're missing is theta. But luckily for us, the question gives us theta. So theta is equal to 60 degrees. So from this right here, we have a matrix, which we know all the values, and we have a vector, which we know all the values. So all we have to do is substitute in, throw it into our handy-dandy calculators, and we find that u prime is going to be equal to, and sorry, I just want to get the brackets kind of right so I don't look like an idiot. And I'm going to use a lot of sig di significant digits. I'm sure it's not going to be this picky on the midterm. So I get u1 prime is equal to 3.598. And we get uh, u2 prime is equal to negative 0 0.232. 2, something like that. So a question to change a basis, it's actually pretty simple if you already know Q. And for the midterm, uh, it's, ones that I've seen are usually just the standard rotation. So if it's a standard rotation, you guys can easily figure out uh, <laughs> that the Q is this, and then you just substitute values, plug and chug. But let's say that you have a question that you don't really know and you have to go to the theory. Well, let's figure out how you can use the original formula to get what you want. So remember that Q is equal, and I'm going to kind of write this in, uh, make it a little bit bigger. So this is the theory part. So you already have your answer, but if you guys want to stick around to see how I got the sines and cosines, this is what we're going to do. So we know this is going to be E1 prime dot with E2. And then moving on to the next one, we got E1 prime again dot e2. And I realize that I messed up the first one. I'm sure that a couple of you guys noticed that mistake right away. I'm not good with proofs. I'll be honest. I'm not the best with proofs. At the bottom, we have e2 prime dot with e1. And then finally, we have e2 prime dot with e2. So if you guys look at this, it's easy to see that the only values that we need to solve for our Q matrix are going to be the vectors e1 and e2 and then E1 prime and E2 prime. So if we look at this, or not look at this really, but if we just remember from before, E1 is 1 comma 0, and E2 is going to be equal to 0 comma 1. So that's not bad. That's nice and easy from before. So the question becomes, okay, well, what are what is going to be my E2 prime and my E1 prime? So what I'm going to do really quick is I'm just going to draw another coordinate system, and I'm going to put our new vectors in. So let's say that this is for the general case of a rotation of theta, so something like this. Sorry, takes a little while. So this is going to be our new E1 prime, and we got E2 prime. And oh, I should probably put the original ones up here. So this was our original E2 and our E1. So. Here's where it gets kind of interesting. So we rotate this by theta. What I can do is I can make a right triangle right here, just like this. So we've got one right triangle. And then on the second side, I can make a second right triangle, just like this. And what's nice about our original E1 and E2 is they had magnitudes of 1. 
and that magnitude is not going to change. So basically in this purple vector, this length right here is going to be 1, and then on the other side, it's going to be the same thing. This length right here is going to be 1. And that's easy to prove because if we look at our E1 and E2, which I guess I'll highlight right here, the magnitude of those vectors is 1. So nice and simple. So from here, we can easily find the components just by using simple trigonometry. Because that theta that we rotated by down there, that's also going to be the theta over on this side. So all we have to do to figure out our, our vectors is just by looking at it and using simple trigonometry. So for E1 prime, we know that the first component is going to be kind of uh, <laughs> the new x component, which is going to be this right here. And in order to get this value, we times the hypotenuse by cosine of theta. But since the hypotenuse is just 1, this is just going to be equal to cosine of theta. And then we can move on to the, uh, the vertical component, which is this one right here, which is going to be the hypotenuse times sine theta. But the hypotenuse, again, being 1, all we get here is sine of theta. So that right there is our E1. And we can go to the other side and say, OK, well, E2 prime and do the same thing. So our, our horizontal component is going to be this component from here to here. And we realize that to get that component using that triangle, it's going to be sine theta. But now we have to recognize that this is now going into the negative direction. And since it's going to the negative direction, this would be negative sine of theta. And then similarly, we can conclude that the height of this is going to be cosine of theta. So from there, we now have our new basis vectors e prime, e1 prime, and e2 prime. So if we look at the thing, all we have to do is dot these vectors together to get our final components. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just go down the list. So our first one is e1 prime dot with e1. So remember, we're just taking the first components and multiplying them together, then multiply the second components to get a scalar. So the first component of e1 prime is cosine of theta. So I'm just going to put cosine of theta. And then we multiply this by the first component of e1 prime, which we can see up there is just 1. So this is going to be times by 1. And then plus the second component of e1 prime, which is sine theta. Oops. I need to keep it consistent. Sometimes I put the brackets around theta. Sometimes I don't. In this case, I'm not going to. And we multiply that by the second component of e1, which is 0. So from here, we can see that cosine theta times 1, well, that's just going to be cosine of theta. And this time I will put the brackets just to really confuse you all. And then sine of theta times 0, well, that's going to be 0. So we can tell that our first component of Q is going to be cosine of theta. Now I can go down the list and go E1 prime dot with E2 now. What we find is that we have the first component of E1 prime, which we remember is cosine of theta. And then we multiply that by the first component of E2. And I'm going to highlight it up here, just right here, so you guys can see, <laughs> see or provide reference to yourselves. The first component there is 0. So this one's going to be times by 0. And now we do the second component. So again, we have the sine theta multiplied by the second component. But this time, the second component is 1. So from here, we got 1. And we can put them together to figure out that this is going to be just sine of theta. Moving down the list, we got e2 prime multiplied by e1. And in this case, now we're looking at our second new vector, which is this one right here. So to get this one, same thing as before, we're going to take the first component, which is negative sine theta. And we're going to multiply this by the first component of e1, which is 1, plus the second component of e2 prime, which is cosine of theta. And we're going to multiply that by the second component of e1, which is 0. So in this case, we get negative sine of theta. And then finally, our last one, we got e2 prime dot with e2. And what we get is the first components are going to stay the same because it's the same vector. So we're going to get, oops, I, <laughs> I make it sound like it's going to be nice and easy. And then I, of course, myself, I get it wrong. So we get negative sine of theta multiplied by the first component of e2, which is 0, 
plus the second component of E2 prime, which is cosine theta, multiplied by the second component of E2, which is 1. So in the end, we get cosine of theta. So all I have to do is take these values and substitute them back into that original matrix right there, Q. And in the end, I get that Q is going to be equal to, and I'll put my matrix uh, brackets right here, matrix uh, uh, tensor, whatever you want to call it, and I get cosine of theta. And then the second one is going to be sine of theta. And in the bottom left, we're going to have negative sine theta. And finally, we're going to get cosine theta. So that's how you kind of derive something if you're given a case you're not familiar with. Again, usually a lot of the midterm cases you will be familiar with. So if it's me doing it, just have the formulas ready. Get yourself that nice easy mark. Don't worry about this too much. But if you guys are in a higher level class, you guys will need to know this. And probably since I ran my mouth in this video and said just memorize them, Dr. Adib will come up with something juicy to really uh, screw you guys over in the midterm. But uh, he's usually a nice guy, so don't worry about that too much. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's just me. <laughs> All right, so that concludes this uh, little video tutorial. Of the, like I said, this quiz, rather nice, rather short. I hope you guys learned something, what a change of basis is. And then uh, hopefully you guys will see later on in life why we use it. So thank you guys all so much for listening. I'll see you guys in quiz number seven.